Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for this opportunity. U.S. co-chair of the OSC Minsk Group, Richard Hogland, met with journalists and he presented a document that, as the heading of the document says, lists six elements taken from the moderate principles that are necessary for establishing a durable settlement in Nagorno-Karabakh. Are these elements being discussed in the Karabakh talks at present? Well, first, thank you, Sarkis, for, for giving me the opportunity to have this conversation today. Uh, I'm always pleased to speak to Radio Liberty. It's an important voice here in, uh, in Armenia, and my congratulations to you and your colleagues for your continuing commitment to independent and open journalism here. Yes, Ambassador Hoagland did speak yesterday and, and reiterated long-standing principles that we as a co-chair and as a government have said will be the basis of any solution to Goro Karabakh. I would make two points about Ambassador Hoagland's comments yesterday. First, this is a restatement, as I said, of long-standing principles that were reiterated also by um, our previous U.S. co-chair, Ambassador Warlick, back in 2014. The six principles that he enunciated uh, reflect uh, long-standing um, principles that have been reaffirmed by all the co-chair governments, by several in international organizations, and that the Armenian government has also um, endorsed as the foundation for negotiations to settle the conflict. I would also reiterate that the principles are a whole. Uh, I've seen some comment on Armenian social media and the immediate reaction, response to Ambassador Hoagland's uh, remarks yesterday, pulling out certain of the principles. I would just say all of them in governor negotiation. One is not more important than the other. One, there's no indication one must happen first before the other. It's a whole package. And it would be wrong to focus on one principle uh, when looking at these basic core principles for settlement. Has Mr. Hoglund presented the complete package of settlement? What is the position of the parties towards these elements? Well, again, nothing that Ambassador Hoglund said yesterday is new. These were principles that Ambassador Warlick enunciated as recently as 2014 when he gave a, a major speech at the Carnegie Institute in Washington. I don't want to speak for Ambassador Hoagland, but I, I, I know that his uh, tenure as our interim co-chair is ending shortly and I think he felt it was important as he was leaving and the new co-chair was coming to underscore again that these are the principles that all parties have agreed to and that there remains continuity in our approach and in these principles as the basis for any negotiated solution. It's uh, known that Andrew Shepard will replace Richard Hogland in the OSCE Minsk Group. What approaches will the U.S. adopt in the Karabakh conflict settlement under the new co-chair? The U.S. commitment to the Minsk process remains unchanged. Our commitment to facilitate a solution that the parties can agree to remains unchanged. Uh, Andrew Sofer, my colleague who will be taking this job from a current position in Vienna, is a very skilled and able diplomat and he will continue to work as his predecessors have to support the process. The latest meeting of the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan took place more than a year ago. On the other hand, the situation at the Armenian-Azerbaijani border escalates from the time to time. How would you assess the current situation in the Karabakh issue and what can be expected in the near future? I agree with you. Uh, I'm con we were concerned earlier in the summer. We saw a rise in rhetoric, we saw a rise in violence along the line of contact, and I feared it would be a particularly tragic summer for people on both sides of the line of contact. I think, though, um, I've been very pleased, and I know Ambassador Hoagland has been, the other co-chairs, we didn't see that continue through the summer. It appears that there has been some reduction in the violence that we've seen in past months along the line of contact over the summer. As you know, the two foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan are going to meet in New York on the margins of the UN General Assembly. That's a very important meeting. It's very important that both sides continue this reduction in violence, this reduction in rhetoric, um, so that there's a good atmosphere for that meeting and both sides can come to that meeting and focus on moving forward.
On this point, Recently, the U.S.-Russian relations have considerably aggravated. The United States and Russia are co-chairs of the OSC Minsk Group. Have the strained U.S.-Russian relations somehow affected the mediatory mission of Washington and Moscow in the Karabakh issue? You're right, Sergius. I think um, uh, anyone who's watching current affairs knows, as you very diplomatic put it, that um, relations are not where America would like them with Russia right now. But the U.S. government, President Trump, Secretary Tillerson, we've made clear that there are important issues where we still need to work with the Russians um, and with other allies around the world. And where those issues are important and we share common goals, we will still make every effort to work with our Russian partners in these areas. And I can assure you, one of those areas is inside the Minsk Group as a co-chair. Uh, we continue to work very closely with the Russians in the process. I've spoken directly to Ambassador Hoagland, and he has told me that the relationship with the Russian co-chair uh, has not changed over the last several months. They still engage often. There's still a lot of creativity, a lot of thinking. And so in terms of this particular issue, we still work very well together. On this one, Hayastan or Rusastani? Uh, Armenia is known to be in the same military and economic union with Russia. Have the tensions between the U.S. and the Kremlin anyhow affected Armenian-American relations? Armenia uh, does a good job of balancing its relationship with all its neighbors. And that includes Russia, that includes Iran, that includes the United States and the European Union. I've tried to be very clear since I arrived. The United States has never looked at our relationship with Armenia as a zero-sum game. That if our relationship got stronger and deeper, somehow that meant Armenia's relationship with other nations had to be less reduced in some way. That's never been the U.S. government's goal, and I don't think that's the Armenian government's goal by any means. But I should be clear, we have always been very open and frank. The goal for us with our Armenian friends, with the Armenian government, is to make sure that Armenia can make its own decisions, its own sovereign decisions about what paths it chooses, what economic models it follows, what political model it follows. And we want to help give Armenia the tools to continue making sovereign choices and to make sure it's not uh, overly influenced or forced by others to follow certain paths that perhaps Armenia doesn't want to follow. If I can, I think we just had a great example of Armenia's ability to, to work and to balance its interests and to work and bring something to the partnership with the United States. And that was Armenia's participation in the NATO exercise in Georgia, the noble partner exercise which happened uh, earlier this month in August. Armenia should be very proud. It was the only CSTO member that participated in this exercise and it contributed a very important component of this military exercise which was the medical units that supported all the other nations that participated. That helped the Armenian military, that helped this exercise, I think it helped security in, in Europe overall. How will the U.S. sanctions against Russia affect Armenian oligarchs? You know, Sarkis, I think the question should be, how do the Armenian oligarchs influence the Armenian economy and impact Armenia's development? That's really the question that the Armenian government and the Armenian people need to think about. For now, I'd say the goal of the sanctions that the U.S. Congress passed and, and were enacted this month um, are directed at Russia and at specifically targeted sectors and individuals of the Ru in the Russian economy. It's a little too early for us to know what the impact will be in Russia, but I do know we're taking every step we can to make sure that the impact is felt by those that the sanctions are targeted on. We have no intention, it is not our uh, goal at all, that these sanctions hurt our friends here in Armenia or the Armenian economy. On this one, I'm Martin, American The reconstruction of Tsar Training Center of the Peacekeeping Brigade of the Armenian Ministry of Defense began in March of this year with the support of the American side. Is the American side planning to conduct training programs for the Armenian armed forces after the reconstruction is completed? Well, yes, I'm, I'm pleased that you referred to the Tsar training uh, facility, which we're helping to renovate and which will support the training of Armenia's peacekeeping brigade. 
that peacekeeping brigade and the work the Armenian uh, peacekeepers are doing all over the world from Afghanistan to Kosovo to Lebanon, it's a real measure of Armenia's growing importance in the diplomatic world, the, the contribution that Armenia is making to international security. But our military cooperation is much broader than uh, the, the Tsar training facility or even our work with the peacekeeping brigade. Uh, we are focused on a range of activities with the Armenian military. Just to focus on sort of three big areas. First, through our foreign military financing program. Since 2002, when our military relationship really deepened, we've spent about $49 million on equipment for the Armenian military. Everything from um, individual body armor to uh, radio communication units and help to medical units. We have an, uh, an international military education training program, IMET, and since 2002 we've spent about seven and a half million dollars to send over 200 Armenian uh, military officers, uh, NCOs, non-commissioned officers, and even some civilians who work in the Ministry of Defense to the leading military institutes and trading academies in the United States, from our um, uh, National War College to our General Staff College. And lastly, the third component of the cooperation is humanitarian assistance projects, where we bring military uh, humanitarian assistance units, which we have, mostly coming through the Kansas National Guard, come to Armenia and they work on projects renovating orphanages, renovating schools, uh, working to improve community water systems. Um, and since 2002, those projects uh, um, have numbered in the dozen or so, and we've spent about $5 million on those projects. Are any new developments or perhaps agreements expected in the time to come in terms of U.S.-Armenian military cooperation? Our, our military relationship has remained steady and close over the last several years. Um, we did, after the April uh, fighting, the tragic fighting in April, uh, approach our friends in the Ministry of Defense to talk to them about uh, the lessons learned from that in terms of uh, the military structure, uh, uh, mil mission command, communication, uh, issues like that, and could we provide some assistance in how the U.S. military does its after-action reports, after-conflict reports, and to help learn the lessons of that fighting. So what was the answer? The answer was the, the ministry would be very interested in that. So we are, uh, and that was a program we had in place, but it became, I think, a little bit of a higher priority after the April events. If I could say, the, the commander of the European, uh, European theater, American forces in, in the European theater, uh, um, traveled, you may recall, right after the war here, and that was one of the things he discussed with the then Minister of Defense and with the head of the army here was how we could help the military learn from some of the experiences that had had occurred in April. So it, it, it has had a high priority here. I just want to be clear, sorry, it's for your, for your viewers. Um, our assistance to the Arme Armenian military is guided by the principle we want to help the Armenian military provide security to the Armenian people, the Armenian state. Um, we, we work on ways to improve the defensive capability of the Armenian military. Um, our position is that it is not helpful to sell offensive weapons, attack weapons, to either side in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Um, I think that is one area where we differ from Russia. If someone were to approach you, put five billion dollars on the table and say, I want to make a deal like the Russian officials are saying and I want you to sell me offensive weapons, do you think that the United States would reject the offer? I can assure you under our current policy, yes, we would resist that offer. During a discussion in U.S. Congress in July, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State John Heffern, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Armenia, stated that the U.S. Department of State is actively discussing an agreement to exclude U.S.-Armenian double taxation. On the other hand, Armenian Minister of Finance Vartan Aramian said that official Yerevan is going to raise the issue during the sitting of the Armenian-American Intergovernmental Commission that is to take place in October. 
At what stage are the negotiations around this agreement and what is the position of the American side on the conclusion of an agreement excluding double taxation between the two countries? I think as you heard from Ambassador Heffron, um, a decision on a double tax treaty uh, will be made by the Department of Treasury. The primary criteria they use to make a decision is whether or not there's a need for a treaty. Uh, we have an existing double taxation treaty that dates from the Soviet time. Um, we are not yet aware of any U.S. company, any U.S. investor, any U.S. business person who has not been able to complete a deal or make a trade arrangement because the current existing treaty, which we still believe is in effect, uh, doesn't meet the needs of the 21st century. If we learn, uh, if we have any evidence that there is a company here that's being affected, can't do a business deal or has had a problem, then I think that will uh, definitely uh, for, uh, make the U.S. Treasury look at making a double taxation treaty here a priority. But right now we just have not gotten any kind of evidence of that, that that's the case. Armenia's trade with the U.S. has fallen in recent years. According to the National Statistical Service of Armenia, last year bilateral trade rounded to $126 million. By this index, the United States was Armenia's 11th largest trade partner. Five years before that, in 2011, Armenian U.S. trade totaled $248 million. In 2006, it was $171 million. Especially in recent times, the American side has repeatedly stated that in bilateral relations, the emphasis should be on the development of trade and economy relations. What is being done to expand the U.S.-Armenian trade and economic relations and what new initiatives are there that we can hear about in the near future? Well, first, l let me be clear. If, if I had evidence, if I thought that a new double taxation treaty was necessary to increase those figures, was a problem, it would be a priority for the embassy and for the U.S. government. But as I said, that is not what I hear are the issues. What I hear are the issues are the things that we're talking about inside our TIFA Council, the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement Council, the agreement that we signed in 2015 with the Armenian government, which is a very concrete and a very important tool for really improving trade and investment between the two countries. That's the forum where we really sit down with the Armenian government and with business, U.S. business and Armenian business. And we ask, what, what, are, what are the reasons that that trade number hasn't gone up? Uh, what are the problems? Are they customs problems? Are they s food sanitary safety standards problems? And we try to address them there. And I have to say, that's what I hear from U.S. business, are some of the, the, the barriers to trade. It's the environment here. It's concern about customs. It's concern about an equal playing field. Can you be sure that if you have a business dispute, the judicial system will be fair and independent and treat all businesses operating in Armenia equally. You probably know, so he's, uh, Armenia has a reputation right now and uh, an international ranking for being a place where it's actually fairly easy and uncomplicated to start a new business, to make a new investment. And I commend Armenia for that and the government for creating that, that environment where starting a business is, is fairly easy and straightforward. The problem comes, in my experience here, talking to U.S. business, is when the businesses yeah, and traders have come, they've started, and they begin to have some success. And then suddenly they run into some tax issues, or suddenly they're customs problems, um, or they have a business dispute and they need to rely on the Armenian judiciary, and they lack the confidence to believe that the, the court system here will treat them fairly. I can tell you, big multinational firms, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if they want to come here, I say, come in. There are lots of opportunities here. And the Armenian entrepreneurial culture, the, the skilled workforce here, is a very attractive uh, reason for U.S. business to come here. Because I'm confident those businesses, which have trade activities around the world, they know how to handle themselves here. They have the resources to take care of themselves here. But most of the businesses, frankly, that want to come here now, that find this market attractive, they're smaller. They want to invest four or five million dollars in a uh, dried fruit processing plant, or they want to open a franchise here of a, of a U.S. restaurant or hotel. Those people don't have that expertise, and they're the people that I worry about and who I counsel. Come and see the embassy, talk to us. 
You can do business here, but you're going to have to be careful and you're going to have to navigate the system. And let me, I commend the Prime Minister. I think he and his government understand that changing this business environment is very important. We're giving U.S. investors, all investors, whether they're European or Chinese or Russian, confidence is very important. And he's made it a priority. And I'm very impressed with what I've seen so far of him moving forward to address some of these issues. How will the limitations on non-immigrant visas in Russia affect the work of the U.S. consular service in Armenia? Thank you for asking that question because there's been some misinformation, I think, floating around uh, social media and the Internet in response to the Russian government's decision that the U.S. mission in Russia must reduce the number of staff we have working in our embassy and our consulates there will be an impact on our ability to issue visas in Russia. After September 1st, uh, Russian nationals in Russia will only be able to apply for a, a visa at the embassy in Moscow. They will not be able to apply for a visa at any of our other three consulates in Russia. But there is no ban or prohibition on visas for Russian citizens or Russian nationals. Russians can still apply for visas after September 1st at the embassy in Moscow. Or they can apply as they can now at any other embassy in the world that may be convenient for them. The question for us here at Embassy Yerevan will be, will we see some Russian citizens travel down here to Yerevan to apply for their visas rather than go to Moscow or because I suspect there'll be quite a long waiting time in Moscow to get an appointment for a visa and you might actually get an appointment faster here in Yerevan. We just don't know and we will have to see what the impact will be. But who knows, if, if more Russians travel down here for visas, it might help the Armenian economy if they spend a little money while they're here. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for this interview.